Hey everyone, Rua here with, after what feels like a while now, another job guide. Last time we were here I tackled Blue Mage, and while it certainly is a mage itself, it's not one in the purest sense of the term. Scholar on the other hand is, and that's what I'll be going over today. Scholar has been around since the Wings of the Goddess expansion, so it's well over a decade old. Korea players of the job probably know the ins and outs of it, so consider this a guide aimed more towards new or returning players, but you should be able to get something out of it regardless of your background. As I just said, the Scholar is a mage in the purest sense of the term. It's a backline caster that has considerable skill in both white and black magic, slightly less than the two classes which specialize in those schools exclusively, but it's nonetheless impressive in its ability to masterfully use both. Its magic power is far beyond that of a red mage as well, but this comes at the cost of physical combat skill and capability, something the red mage soundly defeats it in. Scholar's calling card is its grimoire, which lets it alternate between optimizing the magic skills it commands. Mastering this aspect to the job is absolutely crucial in its successful application on the battlefield. Scholars have a good list of strengths in their favor. The job has a good degree of self-sufficiency, that's to say it's not too dependent on outside support to properly fulfill its role. Its role is adaptable as well. Like Blue Mage, it can literally change its skill set to meet sudden changes in an event. Scholar really feels like a variant of Red Mage at times when you consider its utility potential, with Scholar easily outdoing it in some aspects, especially with regards to enhancing magic. On that note, a Scholar's regen spells completely flatten both Red Mages and White Mages. High power regen spells pretty much make Scholar healing a case of autopilot, with the occasional cure thrown in if someone's taking too much damage. Tabula Rasa is also an excellent SP ability, which pushes regen, among many other things, even further. Among these are two spells exclusive to Scholar, Embrava and Kalstra, both of which can only be accessed during Tabula Rasa. They're both extremely strong spells, and I'll be sure to explain them both later. Scholar has the strongest DOT spells in the game available to it with the Helixes. The base tier of these can be accessed from a Scholar subjob, but the Helixes a Scholar main can cast are very strong. Again, more on them later. Mod is probably its most notable trick, a Scholar is capable of soloing skill chains up to level 2, purely with elemental magic. For the longest time, probably since Vagary up until the adjustments which once again made melee strategies feasible, this trick was the basis of many an endgame strategy. It's not as prominent as it once was, but it's still a very useful option to have around. Storm spells were also part of this strategy, and they have not lost their application ever since. In fact, their uses have actually expanded to include the weapon skills of certain jobs. These storm spells can help push damage output even further, and only add to the job's utility. Overall, a scholar is still pretty much mandatory for any mage strategy in endgame, but uh, dare I say it, well-educated scholar has a place in other group compositions, with it being capable of fulfilling a healer's role if experienced, and smart enough to do so. No form of education is flawless though. I can preach scholars' praises as a healer all I want, but there's just no getting around the fact that the player base considers, rightly in some cases, White Mage to be the only healer acceptable in any content of consequence. A lot of this stems from the fact that White Mage has Kuraga spells, while a scholar can only access the second tier of the line, and even then that demands that they sub White Mage themselves. Scholar can force its Cure 4 to become a copy of Kuraga 4, but it can't do it endlessly, and they will eventually run out of stratagems, and then be left unable to deal with repeat AoE attacks on their front line. Another reason I think is that a Scholar's skill set and spells kind of indicate that it's not meant to achieve instant results, at least not without incurring a heavy penalty in the long run. White Mage can mass heal a lot faster and more consistently, while Black Mage will overall hit harder than it can in a single burst volley. A Scholar's philosophy of gradual and safer results just isn't universally applicable. When it works, it works, but when it doesn't, it could really cost you. 
scholar might have better mastery of magic than a red mage, but a red mage's enfeebling magic ability completely blows scholars out of the water. It's not even a contest. On to a more fundamental problem with a job. Scholar stratagems are job abilities, and since it's so reliant on them, scholar finds itself vulnerable to them being stopped and consumed by paralysis. Paralysis can be removed before any stratagems are used, but the same cannot be said for amnesia. As a mage, Scholar is uniquely and very vulnerable to amnesia, an ailment which will completely hamstring it and maybe even result in serious trouble for its group. Stratagems are also emblematic of another fundamental problem. Scholar has to manage up to four resources at once, HP, MP, stratagems, and spell duration. Scholar lacks emergency buttons it can hit if it finds itself in trouble, again unlike White Mage. Mismanagement mistakes are heavily punished on Scholar, so you can't afford to let your mind wander much while you're on it. It has a very high skill ceiling, probably more so than White Mage, and I emphasized how stressful that could be when I covered it. Finally, despite being around for so long, some of Scholar's job traits and spells feel really underwhelming and are in desperate need of an update. They just haven't aged that well. I'll point these out as and when they show up. Merits on Scholar are a tale of two halves. For me, Group 1 was dedicated to maxing out Helix effects and sublimation. If you're using helixes on high-end content, you want to get all the help you can in ensuring they land for as much damage as they possibly can, so I went with it. Sublimation is key to self-sufficiency, so pushing it further was a no-brainer. Group 2 is really up for debate. I toyed around with a few allocations before settling on what you see here. I suggest capping out focalization putting some merits into one of the other stratagems you think you might need, but putting some points into Enlightenment to unlock it. Storm Surge's effect is just not good enough by today's standards, and Amiga's stat buff is not what you're using Storm Spells for to begin with. It's best to start by explaining how the Grimoire and stratagems work, or nothing that follows is going to make any sense. You might notice that without any effects active, a scholar's natural magic skills are very low. Activating either light arts or dark arts will affect these magic skills depending on which of the two grimoire is active. Light arts increases healing, enfeebling, enhancing, and divine magic skill. It also reduces the MP cost, casting and recast timers of white magic spells by 10%. Casting black magic spells in this grimoire will incur a 20% negative penalty to the same. Dark Arts, on the other hand, increases elemental, enfeebling, and dark magic skill, while also having the same aforementioned effects on black magic spells. Activating either grimoire will also enable the stratagem submenu to be accessed, and stratagems to be used in accordance with the active grimoire. Stratagems are job abilities which have various effects on spells of their respective schools, Stratagems have a set number of charges depending on your current level, and the universal reuse timer is also dependent on the same. A max level scholar will have 5 charges available to use. As soon as a stratagem is activated, the universal reuse timer starts ticking down, restoring the charge once enough time has elapsed. A scholar can choose to keep stacking stratagems if they so desire, but they should be careful. Once the timer has finished, it only restores one of the expended charges, not all of them, even if they were all used at once. The reuse timer's base is 48 seconds, but when reaching 550 spent job points, this drops to 33 seconds. You need to get this job gift as soon as possible, preferably before you start any notable content. There are three ways to restore stratagems if you run out and urgently need them back. One is to have a Corsair use Random Deal or Wildcard on you, and the other is to activate Tabula Rasa, which will instantly restore them all. Speaking of which, let's get into job abilities and stratagems. Tabula Rasa is Scholar's first SP ability, and it's a good one. Tabula Rasa resets the timers of Light and Dark Arts, fully restores all stratagems, and allows them all to be used without expending charges for the duration of 3.5 minutes. 
While active, Tabula Rasa will also increase the potency of all regen and helix spells cast by a decent amount, and enables access to two super versions of said spells, Embrava and Kalstra. I will address Embrava and Kalstra separately later on in the guide, as one really needs to know how to best use them. Tabula Rasa really frees up a scholar's power by letting them spam stratagems with no penalty whatsoever, so under its effects a scholar becomes capable of some pretty spectacular things. Make the most of it while it's active. Sublimation is the keystone of scholar's self-sustain. Once activated, Sublimation starts draining the Scholar's HP and storing it into the ability until it has taken 25% of their maximum HP, at which point its icon changes and the drained HP is ready to be returned as MP. There's a few key things to know about Sublimation. The first is that Sublimation can be forcibly cancelled and the MP returned to you before the icon has changed, but this is not recommended unless you're in really dire straits. Speaking of dire straits, sublimation will automatically cancel itself if the scholar falls below 50% of their maximum HP. Keeping regen on yourself will generally stop this from happening. The third is that the HP drain rate can be accelerated from its 8 tick base with JSE equipment to make it cap out faster. The fourth is that sublimation and the refresh spell do not stack and it actually prevents refresh from taking effect on you if you have it ticking down. Finally, since it is effectively a DOT effect on yourself, sublimation can be used to prevent you from being immobilized by sleep spells. This works against you as well since you cannot rest for MP if you have a DOT on you. Using stone skin will help you get around this. You might notice that when first starting out on Scholar, some of your spells are greyed out and cannot be used. These spells become available when you use the Addendum Stratagem concurrent with your active Grimoire. Using Addendum White while in Light Arts will give you access to Ailment Removal spells and higher tier Raise Re-Raise spells. If you're in a group with the express purpose of being their healer, this is probably going to be the first stratagem you activate. Addendum does not wear off following a spell cast. It will only wear off when changing to the opposite Grimoire. Accession is one of Scholar's most valuable stratagems. Accession forces your next white magic spell cast to become area of effect rather than just single target, at the cost of doubling its MP cost and its recast timer. With a decent fast cast set, this penalty is not really a problem, but depending on what you're casting, you might want to use Penury to cancel out the MP penalty if MP is going to be an issue. But remember to be mindful of how many stratagems you're using and whether or not it's really worth the exchange. Penury's 50% MP cost reduction is situationally useful, but be sure to check the MP cost of what you're casting, otherwise you could just waste a charge. Perpetuance is another key stratagem. Perpetuance doubles the duration of the next enhancing magic spell you cast, but this can be increased well beyond this figure with certain equipment. Perpetuance is another one you need to consider whether it's worth using or not. I would never really bother using it with spells which already have a decent duration, like Protect or Shell, but I would certainly use it on important spells like Region 5, Phalanx, and especially Embrava. If you're certain you're not going to be changing a bar spell anytime soon, then by all means extend its duration, but, and this really bears repeating, Remember that you're often going to be using Perpetuance with a session, and even Penury as well at times. Always be mindful of your situation, and if you can afford to expend the charges. Mismanaging your stratagems could be disastrous in the heat of battle if things turn suddenly sour. Rapture is a really niche stratagem, which seems neat to have available, but really, you'll very rarely use it. Rapture increases the cure potency of the next cure spell cast by 50%. Rapture's problem is that it's just not aged well since it was first implemented. A scholar can easily cure people by a hefty amount even without Rapture these days. 
there's only a handful of situations that could call for rapture. The most common you'll encounter are certain jobs that can push their HP to high levels. This is when another stratagem could come in handy. Tranquility lowers the enmity generated by your next healing magic spell. Like Rapture before it, Tranquility is a very niche stratagem, but if your group lacks a proper tank job to hold hate, then Tranquility will really show its worth. It's honestly up to you whether you want to merit it or not. Okay, moving on to Dark Arts now. Parsimony does the same thing Penury does, but for black magic. Parsimony cuts the MP cost of the next black magic spell in half, but really, its only real purpose is with two spells, Impact and Kalstra. Impact costs a massive amount of MP to cast, so Parsimony will really be worth using whenever you're casting it. Manifestation is a really handy stratagem to have on hand, like its Light Arts equivalent, a session. Manifestation causes your next black magic spell to become area of effect, but like a session, it does not work on every spell you have, namely all of your elemental magic spells. It does work on all black magic enfeebling spells though, so it can be used for crowd control with sleep 2 and break. Switching from light arts just to use manifestation might prove to be what saves the day in events like Dynamis, where crowd control is paramount. Addendum Black allows the Scholar to cast high-level elemental magic and some other enfeebling magic spells like Dispel, Sleep 2, and Break, which would normally be unusable without the Addendum being active. If you're doing any serious magic damage worth note, or if you're in a group specifically for crowd control, then Addendum Black should always be active. It's worth noting that if you're subbing Red Mage, which I highly recommend be your default sub job by the way, then you already have Dispel and Sleep 2 available from your sub job. It's still worth keeping Addendum Black active for Break and the Elemental Magic though, so the point still stands. Imminence. Now this is probably Scholar's most famous stratagem. Imminence adds skill chain properties to the next Elemental Magic spell you cast, at the cost of removing its Magic Burst ability. The applications of Imminence should be self-evident by this point, but suffice to say, Imminence is what made Scholar the keystone of Endgame for such a long time. Imminence lets the Scholar deal strong damage from self-generated skill chains and provides the best opportunity to land a strong helix spell. More on this later. I can't show all of the skill chains here, so I'll direct your attention to a forum page I've linked below for the full list of skill chains possible. Vocalization and ebullience are what a scholar can use to land a single powerful spell during a skill chain window. Ebullience increases the damage dealt by the next black magic spell by 20%. Vocalization increases the magic accuracy of the spell cast, so it's common to see the two used together on high end content. But here's the caveat if you've generated said skill chain with eminence, you're already down two stratagems. So these two being used together, you've burned through four of your five charges in one shot. You'll need to make this spell count. Unless the skill chain is being generated for you, then I'd recommend it be used on a helix. That way, damage is still being dealt while your charges recover. Enlightenment allows a scholar to cast spells from both schools which would normally be locked behind either of the addendum stratagems. The neat thing about Enlightenment is that it lets you access something like Raise 3 when you're in Dark Arts. This is only one of its uses though. You could just use it to cast a race on yourself if there's something on you you really need to remove immediately. I put one level into Enlightenment just so you have this option around. You never know when it might be needed. Libra's a unique, and a situationally useful ability, especially in battles that demand strict enmity control. When activated, Libra will show the scholar the enmity values each party member has on their target. This information can then be relayed to a thief or a dragoon if you have one, and they need to do something about their enmity, 
or to a warrior being far too aggressive for their own good. Libra's real use for me, though, is to be used in conjunction with Scholar's second SP ability. Caper Emissarius is this SP ability. Caper Emissarius transfers all of the enmity the party has accumulated to a party member of the Scholar's choice. Caper Emissarius is a great countermeasure against NMs which have enmity reset mechanics on single targets. Just use it once it happens and put the NM back on your tank. It's also really useful if used in the inverse way, useful against NMs who you need to suddenly get off your tank. Assess the situation and make the call. Make sure your group knows Caper Emissarius is being used, as the last thing you want is for one of your unprepared frontline members to suddenly have all the group's enmity out of nowhere. Caper Emissarius is generally planned ahead of time, but if something's gone horribly wrong in a plan and the tank is in serious trouble, then you might have to think on your feet. Okay, let's get into spell mechanics as there's a lot to cover here. Let's start with regen. If you've played White Mage for any decent length of time, you've come across and hopefully use regen with a session. Scholar's version of the same is far superior. Regen 5's base potency is 40 HP per tick, but this increases to a base of 64 with Light Arts active. Scholar has three JSE pieces which significantly increase the potency of regen further. The Dynamis Divergence Staff, the Arbitel Bonnet, and the Bookworm's Cape once augmented. Look to get these pieces as soon as you can, as they will go a long way in improving your performance when acting as the healer. When Tabula Rasa goes up, regen gets even more insane, adding another 12 HP per tick to the final amount, and also extending its duration. Regen's potency is not determined by enhancing magic skill, so gearing for it is actually pretty simple. Work in potency from the aforementioned JSC and use duration in the Telchin Lama and other slots. The Arbitel Bracers should be in the set as well since you're usually using regen with perpetuance. Here's the real showstopper though. While Tabula Rasa is active, you can stack regen 5 with Embrava. Embrava is the single best enhancing spell in the game, and it's locked behind Tabula Rasa for a reason. Embrava gives three effects at once. A 72 tick regen, a 6 tick refresh, and a 25% magic haste. These values all stack with their enhancing magic variants, so during Tabula Rasa, it's possible for a scholar to have a near 200 tick regen and almost cap the magic haste value for its entire party. Embrava can be tricky to gear for, since in order to cap out its effects, the scholar needs to have 500 enhancing magic skill while also working in enhancing duration to make it stay for as long as it can. Another thing to be really careful of is that Embrava costs 20% of your maximum MP to cast. This increases to 40% if it's used with a session, so do not forget to use it with Penury as well to cancel out this cost. You have unlimited stratagems under Tabula Rasa anyway, so there's no penalty for doing so. One last point to convey on Embrava is that it overwrites itself, so recasting it right before Tabula Rasa expires is a next level trick, bringing the possible duration of Embrava to 10 minutes. Helixes are the inverse of regen. They're powerful single target elemental magic spells, which apply a DOT effect dependent on the damage they deal when they hit. The potency of Helix DOT is capped at 9,999 damage, so landing one for over 10,000 damage will yield no long-term benefit. It's still important to get a Helix to hit for as much as it can and try and hit this barrier though. Helixes are unique among elemental magic, since they will always gain the effect of weather and day bonuses without the need to use the Hatchery and Obi in the cast. This is both a positive and a negative, as casting a helix which opposes the current day will result in a penalty to final damage. Weather should never be an issue though due to storm spells. Scholar starts out with the first tier helix spells and learns the second tier automatically when reaching 1200 job points spent. Tier 2 helixes will always overwrite first tiers, so making skill chains with first tiers, which is highly advised, will not be a hindrance. It's possible to make all the Helix spells hit the damage and DOT cap, but you'll find that Lumino Helix and Nocto Helix, light and dark if you're keeping score, 
are generally the easiest to get there due to the amount of affinity gear you can get for those two elements. Lumino Helix has the Daybreak and the Weatherspoon ring, while Nocto Helix has the Pixie Hairpin and the Archon ring. I just touched on something that bears emphasizing. Using a Helix as an imminent skill chain closer will result in a slightly longer burst window from the ensuing skill chain. And since universal cooldown between casts is a thing, you'll find it much easier to double burst off your own skill chain if you're doing this. One final thing to note about Helixes is that their damage can be increased at the cost of their duration through the ability Modus Veritas. Another ability that has not aged well at all. Not only is the ability notoriously difficult to land on anything worthwhile, thanks to an infamous and legendary exploit that saw scholars one-shotting CNMs back in the day, but Modus Veritas does not allow a helix to break the damage cap, so it's completely worthless. This brings us to the super helix available during Tabula Rasa, Kalstra. Kalstra is an extremely nasty dark magic spell that works similar to a helix, but the DOT effect on Kalstra breaks the damage cap helixes are subject to. That's right, the damage Kalstra lands for is the exact strength of the DOT. Since Kalstra stacks with Nocto Helix 2, much like Embrava does with Regen 5, and its damage can be pushed far with ebullience and affinity equipment, a scholar can cast both and literally watch their target die, completely helpless to stop the DOTs from eating them alive. Like Helixes, a stronger Kalstra recast on the target will overwrite the previous value, but really, most of the time it's already dead. Kalstra also mirrors Embrava in that it will consume 20% of your maximum MP when cast, and it's a cost you're usually just going to have to take, as you're generally using Focalization and Ebullience during a Magic Burst window to ensure Kalstra lands for maximum damage. Okay, Storm Spells. Storms are among a scholar's best utility spells. Storms simply give individual weather effects to people they're cast on, giving a 25% damage bonus, assuming the second tier storms are being used, to elemental damage corresponding with the storm's element. Using the Hatcher and Obi will force this effect to always activate. My lecture on helixes has a lesson which applies here. A penalty will be imposed if damage of the opposing element is dealt by the player while using this tactic. It's a hard mistake to make, but it's still worth mentioning. Let's look at the application of these spells for a moment. The first is that they increase the damage dealt by elemental weapon skills, hybrid weapon skills as well. If it's a particularly powerful weapon skill to begin with, say Lead and Salute, which already has affinity equipment amping it up, then the results of using Voidstorm 2 on a Corsair and then using the Hatcher and Obi in their Lead and Salute set will be rather spectacular. The second is that they increase magic damage dealt even if the magic skill is not elemental magic. Storms will power up ninjutsu and blue magic both. On a side note, I found that blue mage and ninja both work really well with the scholar, for reasons I'll probably go into in a video to come on general gameplay advice. The third application is that Aurora Storm 2 can be used to overwrite double darkness weather, which would usually cripple cure potency in events like Dynamis and some recent high tier battlefields. This is a pretty basic fundamental rule of cure calculation. Most white mages watching this will already know about it, but it bears saying regardless. The double darkness weather will reduce cure power by 25% if Aurora Storm is not active to counter it. I mentioned earlier with Rapture that scholars can cure for more than enough to keep people going without it, and it's best I explain how. Aurora Storm 2 will apply a 25% bonus to Cure Potency when using the Hatcher in Obi, and will also force the Reticence effect on the Chatoyant Staff to activate, making this a 35% bonus to Cure Power if both are used together. Make sure you don't forget to full-time Aurora Storm 2 when your job is to be the healer. A basic Cure set for Scholar is actually very similar to one a White Mage would use, minus JSE pieces of course. 
The same lessons from my White Mage Guide apply here. You need to have enough healing magic skill, mind, and vitality to cap cure power. Enough cure potency to reach the 50% cap, and enough enmity reduction to keep hate off you. It might take some work to get all this in order, but it's essential, since you simply lack the sheer curing power of a white mage. You can make yourself competitive if you try though. The Chatoyant Staff is your best starting option when you have Aurora Storm 2 active, but the Rhaetic Rod plus 1 will ever so slightly beat it. It's a neat upgrade, but it shouldn't be at the top of your shopping list. Look to get it eventually, but don't worry. The Chatoyant Staff will cover you until you can get the Rhaetic Rod. When it comes to the elemental magic damage side of Storm spells, Scholar has yet another rabbit to pull out of its hat. Climber form by itself increases the magic accuracy of spells which match the current storm spell by a minor amount, but it's got another effect on top of that when it's combined in a casting set with the Arbitel Loafers. The Loafers give another 15% damage bonus to the spells being cast under the effect of Climber form. The Loafers need to be in your set when the spell lands, but the 15% bonus is more than enough to justify their use. So, a Scholar potentially has a 25% damage bonus from the Hatcher in Obi, 20% from Ebulliance, and 15% from Climaform if the spell corresponds. Climaform also works with Manifestation, but your party members who get the effect will only get the magic accuracy bonus. A shame, but it is what it is. I'd like to see Climaform buff to give more magic accuracy, and for it to give its damage bonus by default with the Arbitel Loafers making it go further for the Scholar. Have to wait and see, won't we? Since we've just gone over a healing set, I'd best go over an example of an elemental magic set to round this out. A Scholar will likely not hit as hard as a Black Mage, and it's excluded from the ESU3 set, which is a big thing which holds it back in this regard. But with some know-how, you can be competitive. Gearing for elemental magic and helixes is pretty much the same thing, with the exception of not using the Hatcher in Obi for a helix. As it was with a healing set, the same rules of Black Mage, Red Mage, or Geomancer face when gearing for elemental magic apply here. You need magic accuracy, magic attack bonus, intelligence, and magic burst damage as pretty much all of your optimal damage is going to come from bursting off your own skill chains. On that note, a general tip about mana burn groups. Your primary role will probably be to apply storm spells and set up skill chains when in this type of group. Rarely will it be to be the main source of damage as well. Black mages should be hitting a lot harder than you, and if you go first and land a spell before they do, you end up lowering their damage due to the way resistance walls work. Landing a helix towards the end of the window is a good tactic, as you only need it to hit for 10,000 damage. Animus Minuo and Animus Orgio are two spells in dire need of an update. These spells give a small amount of enmity gain or enmity loss to those they're cast on. Minuo reduces enmity by 10, while Orgio increases it by 20. Minuo is harmless to cast on yourself if your healing set isn't quite up to scratch, but the jobs you'd usually use Orgio on already have Crusade, which soundly beats it. I'd like to see these two spells scale with Enhancing Magic skill to make them more useful. Adloquium is the definition of wasted potential. Adloquium gives a regain effect of 10 TP per tick. Added during the Abyssia days like the Animus spells, Adloquium has just not aged well. I would again like to see this scale with Enhancing Magic skill will possibly even get a bonus in potency during Tabula Rasa. Come to think of it, Embrava actually used to give regain, and a good amount of it too. Perhaps this is why Adloquium is in the state it's in. <laughs> I've mentioned the importance of stratagem management a few times in this guide, and it's a skill you'll gradually pick up, but I'll give you a quick example of good management in a party where you're starting an event and you've got the healer's position. The first thing you'll want to do is get sublimation charging, and then activate light arts. Make addendum white the first stratagem you use to unlock the full array of your healing spells. Then use a session with protect and shell 5, but do not use them with perpetuance, that's a waste of precious charges. Then use a session and perpetuance with regen 5, 
by now you should have one stratagem left with another almost recovered. You can opt to use Phalanx with a Session and Perpetuance depending on the expected length of the battle, but if you choose to go with only a Session, you'll have your last stratagem back soon for a Session with a given bar spell. Take this time to cast Re-Raise 3 and Aurora Storm 2 if you're waiting for a few seconds for the charge to restore. By this point, other buffs in the party should have been done, and you're all good to go, rather than having to wait for you to recover charges because they were not managed properly. Preparing before a battle is good and all, but what about in the heat of battle where there's constant AoE ailments and damage flying around? That's when you really need to be on point, and constantly analyse the situation. Healing on Scholar is made easier with Embrava and Regen for sure, but Scholar still demands a proactive, rather than a reactive player be at the helm. Spotting AoE attacks, or better yet having a session active and ready to go is good form, but it's an acquired skill. For those coming to Scholar from White Mage, this skill will likely already be second nature, spotting dangerous attacks and AoE ailments, but for players new to the healer's role, it's important that you do not lose your head if things start piling up. Just do your best with what you now know, and learn from your experiences. Constant success is a lousy teacher after all, it tricks you into thinking you can't lose. You may run into some resistance and hesitancy from people unwilling to depart from the proven staple that is White Mage, but persevere. Good showings on a job tend to get the word around. There's precious few jobs that are universally applicable to all content, but Scholar finds itself in an advantageous position of being able to fill in for, and even surpass in some cases, the usual suspects using the distinct tools it has. Scholar is a job that incorporates elements of two dichotomous mages, and puts its own unique twist on them. Many unfortunately still only know it as a skill chain generator for endgame, while in actuality there's so much here beyond that. I hope I've done a decent job of showcasing just some of what it can do to new players, or to those current players interested in a break from the norm and taking up its mantle. For now though, I'll sign off. I'll see you all next time.